All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the lecture on evolution. So, let's start. Let's start by defining the word. What does it mean to evolve? I want you to think of it not in biological terms, but just in everyday usage. Something evolves. Languages evolve. Fashion trends evolve. Hairstyles evolve. It means to change over time. Often slowly, but it simply means to change over time. Biologically, evolution is no different. Biological evolution is change over time. So what changes? What changes? Do individual organisms change? Or does a population change slowly over a long period of time? And the answer to that one is populations. Individual living things do not evolve. Individual living things can adapt. Individual living things have quite a range of adaptation that they can achieve, but they cannot actually evolve in the true sense of the word. Evolution requires multiple generations. It also requires two mechanisms. Those mechanisms are natural selection and mutation. Let's go ahead and define natural selection first. Natural selection You've probably heard of it described as survival of the fittest and that is true but the word fit actually means something quite different in biology than in our everyday usage as well. The best definition for natural selection is that individuals with certain traits are better suited for the environment than others. And thus, as a result of being more fit for the environment, they have more offspring. Individuals with certain traits are better suited to the environment and thus they experience greater reproductive success than other individuals. I use the word fit. Biological fitness. We think of fit as somebody who goes to the gym, you know, in good physical shape. That is not the biological definition of the term. The biological defini definition of the term is the number of offspring an organism produces relative to the total offspring produced. I'm not going to write all of this out, but number of offspring an organism produces relative to the total number of offspring produced by all individuals of that species. In other words, the more you reproduce, the more fit you are, in a biological sense. It doesn't matter how physically strong you are, it doesn't matter any of that, it only matters how many offspring do you produce. If you produce the most offspring, biologically, that organism would be the most fit. So make sure that when we use that word, you're not thinking of it, you know, in our everyday usage, you're thinking of it in biological terms. So natural selection, says that individuals that have traits that make them the most fit are going to have the most offspring and so over time population is going to see a shift toward the traits of that particular individual. That's the idea. Mutation we'll get to. Uh, mutation is the way that we get new genes inserted into the, uh, into the gene pool of a particular species. So we'll get there. Uh, the fish that we have up on the board is a guppy. 
That's what they look like uh, in the wild. We've bred them quite a bit. We have quite a few domestic varieties, but in the wild, they, uh, they look something like that. If you look at a population of guppies in the wild, they live on the island of Trinidad, which is the very southern part of the Caribbean, just off the coast of Venezuela. And if you were to look at the male guppies, there are some variety, there's some variety there in terms of coloration. This is very much, very much oversimplified, but it hits the, the point home that I want to make, so we're, gonna, we're going to use it as an example. There tends to be two color variations in male guppies in the wild that were observed, at least in one particular river in Trinidad. Bright guppies, dull guppies. Both of which, and these are males by the way, male guppies. Both of which are controlled by genes. Genes are segments of DNA that code for a particular trait. And so if you're a male guppy, hypothetically, you could have the genes that produce the brighter coloration and the genes that produce the coloration that is a bit more dull. Now, females choose which males to uh, reproduce with. And the general favorite coloration, of course, is the brighter coloration. If you can afford to devote energy to that kind of coloration, you're viewed as a very fit individual if you're a male guppy. However, in addition to females favoring the bright males, they also tend to stand out a bit more predator, predator, predatory fish. So, a lot of them die before they reach the age to be successfully reproducing in large numbers which means mostly dull guppies remain, and that's who gets to actually mate. What scientists did in the island of Trinidad, or on the island of Trinidad, is they did a study with guppies that I think perfectly illustrates how evolution works. This is a Microsoft Paint picture of a river right here a waterfall barrier and a stream that ultimately leads down into that river. The population of guppies initially lived only in the large river. And I've got two different colorations shown. Again, this is not necessarily the way they actually look, but you get the idea. The brownish color represents the male guppies that have duller coloration. The orange represents the guppies that have brighter coloration. And if you look in this picture, four out of the five guppies show the dull coloration. That would be roughly, not roughly, that would be exactly 80% of the guppies showing that particular physical trait. The bright colored males represent 20% of the population of male guppies. This is the frequency that we observe of these two genes in that population. Why does it exist like that? Because natural selection has limited the reproductive success of the bright guppies due to the fact that there's predatory fish in this river that can see them much more easily and keep the population of them in check. So what scientists did is they thought, hey, if we take a small section of this population down here and move it up into the stream where there are no predatory fish, I bet we're going to see the gene frequencies change and shift toward the bright coloration because up here, the only thing that will be guiding the coloration of the males will be the female mate choice. And we already know that they will prefer the brighter colored males. So they did that. They moved a small population of guppies from the river to the stream. After 15 generations, they went back and looked at the gene frequencies for male coloration, and to nobody's surprise, it shifted quite a bit. I don't know if it was exactly these percentages, but this is the general idea. In the stream, 
natural selection favored a different physical feature. Natural selection guides populations' gene frequencies. These guppies, this population of guppies, it evolved. At least the one that they put up in the stream evolved. Down here, it remained at this frequency. But up here, the population changed. It evolved. No single guppy evolved. No single guppy went from dull to bright. But the population as a whole saw the shift. So here's a quick summary of that in writing. This experiment illustrates how natural selection impacts population. In the river, predation limited the reproductive success of brightly colored males. They were not very fit in the river. However, in the stream without predators, the brightly colored males were now the most fit fish. And over time, we saw an increase in the frequency of the brightly colored males and thus the frequency of that particular gene increased while the dull gene, dull coloration gene, decreased over time. This was an actual study that was done in, uh, in Trinidad. I think it really, really shows the concept of evolution quite well. So here's a bit more and then we'll look at Another example of how evolution works. Individual organisms within a population have specific genes that determine their physical traits. In this example, the male guppies have the dull and the bright coloration. Obviously, guppies have many, many more genes. That was just one example. And as we said, organisms with certain genes produce more offspring than organisms with other genes that control their traits. And over time, what evolves, what changes, is the frequency of the genes within that population. Now, guppies were a pretty small-scale example. But how do we look at a much larger scale of change? One way to do that is to look at creatures on islands. I'm not sure if you recognize this, but this is a Galapagos tortoise. All right, these are the largest tortoises in the world. They live on the Galapagos Island chain off the coast of South America. And in fact, there is a trend that is seen on islands, which is really fascinating. Small organisms tend to get larger on islands, while really large organisms tend to get smaller. Tortoises on the Galapagos are massive. On the island of, of Cyprus in the Mediterranean Sea, they found elephants that were the size of a dog. Elephants, you know, as you know, in the mainland are quite a bit larger. So there's this strange tendency of species to grow and shrink when they're isolated on islands, which is fascinating, I think. The really cool thing about islands is that they are a showcase for evolutionary change. The natural selection pressures on an island are so vastly different from that which is seen on the mainland. Primarily because on these island chains, there usually aren't any land-based predators, which means that physical features that are only there to protect against predators, they're not useful on these islands, and so natural selection no longer favors them. It instead favors things that we would never see on the mainland because such traits would be harmful and would never survive due to predation. So let's just talk about this island chain in particular. This is the Galapagos Islands. It's a volcanic island chain located off the coast of South America. So I'm going to draw an absolutely horrendous drawing of South America here. Okay. So there is South America. Right. The Galapagos Islands are roughly over here, <clears throat> off the coast of Ecuador. So, current geological estimates place age of the Galapagos Islands, at least how long they've been above sea level, at roughly five million years, which means within the past five million years, land-based organisms could have colonized from the South American mainland. Once they get to the islands, like I said, the pressures of natural selection are very different, which means 
their ancestors that still live on the mainland will be similar enough to the Galapagos organisms that we should recognize the resemblance. But the ones on the island are going to be very different compared to the ones on the mainland thanks to the fact that they don't have land-based predators to concern them. So colonization by land animals will have taken place within the last five million years, which is enough time for noticeable changes to occur, but not enough time for the organisms on the island to be unrecognizable compared to their mainland relatives. There's been a lot of study done on these islands. The initial study was done by this gentleman. It's one of the first studies was done by this gentleman. Charles Darwin, one of the most famous naturalists. He went to the Galapagos Islands in the 1830s, and he noticed that many species on the island were similar to South American relatives, but with notable differences. Let's go ahead and look at what some of those organisms were. So the three species here are all organisms that are found on the South American mainland. These are organisms that are found here. The one on the top left is a bird called a cormorant. It eats fish. We actually have them here in Missouri. You may have seen one. Birds can fly, of course. And if you can fly, there are a number of adaptations that you must have. You have to, be, you have, to have wings, first of all. But that's not enough. You have to have a light body weight. And with birds, we see this in the form of honeycomb structure in their bones. We see it in the reduction of the size of certain organs. We see it in the elimination of a tailbone. All they have is feathers. If you've ever, and feathers are very light, that's another thing as well. If you've ever actually held a bird, they're extremely lightweight. That's an adaptation for flight. But you know what wings take a lot of? Wings take a lot of energy. And if you're devoting your energy to your wings, that's energy that you're not devoting to something else. Because you see, energy is a limited thing for organisms to be able to use. So, energy put toward one thing is energy not spent on something else. So what if there's no use for wings anymore? Cormorants feed on fish. They can swim through the water just fine without wings. So, on the Galapagos Islands, having wings is a waste of energy. It has no benefit like it would have on the mainland. So what would you expect to happen over the course of a couple million years on this island chain? No individual cormorant has lost its wings, lost use of its wings, but over many generations, population experienced a shift. And this is what Galapagos cormorants look like today. The wings have not had enough time to become completely I wouldn't say eliminated, but they're still, they're still there, even though they don't really serve a purpose at this point. They're vestigial, that's the term for it. No longer serving the original purpose. Also, if you look at the body shape, it's much bulkier. And if you were to pick this bird up, it would be much heavier than its mainland relative. Because being lightweight was an adaptation for flight. But if you're on land, and it's all about being able to swim for, to find food and not fly, and being bigger is also and more energy efficient for a lot of organisms. Why would you not? Why would you not be bigger? So natural selection has favored bulkier body size. It's favored the elimination of energy wasting wings on the island chain. Our tortoise. That's called a Chaco tortoise. It's a South American species that is considered the closest living relative to the Galapagos tortoise. 
tortoises found their way to the island. I think it's obvious how the bird got there, but how does a tortoise get there? Um, they think it may have floated in with mats of vegetation. With the energy reserves that they have, they've actually determined that tortoises can float individually in the water for several miles, including long enough to get out to the island chain simply by floating there. Regardless, they did find their way there, and over time, quite a dramatic shift. You can see the person here. To give you an idea of the relative size of these tortoises, they are massive. So, predatory defenses on the mainland, if you're a tortoise. The ability to retract much of the body into the shell. The ability to fit into holes for protection. On the island chain, there's no, predator. there's no predators anymore. So, those two things are no longer useful. Which means natural selection is going to favor the most energy efficient method body size, which is large, generally speaking. And so we see this island gigantism that we always observe, almost always observe, with species that find their way to islands. No predatory limitations, you get big. They obviously can't retract into their shell anymore. They're clearly not going to fit into a burrow. But who cares? There's nothing to eat them. At least not when they're an adult. So, gigantism seen in Galapagos tortoises. Off to the top right, we have a green iguana. And this is a marine iguana. So this is not an example of what a lack of predators will do. This is an example of natural selection favoring radiation into a new habitat. Marine iguanas live in the rocky coastal areas of the island. Things to notice. Coloration, first of all, tends to match the more grayish tones of the rocks as opposed to being green, to camouflage with leafy growth. The body is much bulkier. It's not climbing in trees at this point. It's going to be around the rocks. It has extremely strong claws for gripping not only to withstand crashing waves, but for feeding. Because it goes underwater, grabs onto rocks, and feeds on algae, which it scrapes off with its small, sharp teeth that you can see here. Because it scrapes off algae, to be able to better access the rocks, natural selection has favored a flat face. Flatter than its ancestry. Clearly, natural selection favors very different traits on the rocky shores of the Galapagos than it does in the trees of the South American mainland. All three of these species, and several others on the island as well. Oh, and this is a marine iguana. That's what it's called, marine iguana. All of these species on the uh, Galapagos Islands very clearly have experienced different parameters of natural selection. Very different individuals in the past were fit on the island chain that would not have been fit on the South American mainland. And so this was what ultimately convinced Darwin that populations change over time and thus organisms experience changes, modifications, based on natural selection parameters, what's the environment around that species. And that was his concept of natural selection, which he wrote about in uh, in the 1840s, right? The Origin of Species was the book that he wrote. Uh, there were a number of scientists who actually had ideas similar to him, but he and a guy named Alfred Russell Wallace were the first two to explain how this change worked in the form of natural selection. So as we said, in the absence of land-based or terrestrial predators, Natural selection no longer favors physical attributes that exist only for defensive purposes. And the key here is that it is a waste of energy. And I want you to read this last part very uh, closely. 
if energy is spent in one particular aspect of an organism's life, less energy is available to spend in other areas. It's called the principle of allocation. If you allocate an energy to one particular aspect of your physical being, there's less available for something else. I want you to think of it this way. Think of it like money. You have a budget. You can spend money on whatever you want, but you have a limited amount. And if you live in Florida, and you spend some of your money on a snowmobile, that is a completely useless thing to have in Florida. It's a waste of money. But if you spend your money on a snowmobile in Canada, that's a useful thing that will help you in that environment. And so, obviously, spending the money on that snowmobile depends where you are. Likewise, what organisms spend energy on, if they spend it on something that natural selection favors them to have, then they'll be considered fit in that environment and they'll successfully reproduce the most. But again, energy is limited. You can't be the best at everything. It's organisms that have traits that are the best for their particular environment that have the most offspring. This is a cave salamander of some sort. Cave dwelling salamander. So how did this salamander ultimately become the way it is now. It's blind. It has no pigment. Its ancestors had both. A population of salamanders would have found its way to a cave, and over time the population would have changed, eventually becoming what we see now, blind and pigment-free. No individual salamander just suddenly lost its eyesight or lost its pigment. In a cave, where you can't see anything and nobody can see you, looking flashy with colorful pigments, or being camouflaged with pigments that help avoid predators in that regard, it's kind of useless. Having eyes that are able to see well in a cave is useless, which means waste of energy, Coloration, also a waste of energy. The principle of allocation taught us that if energy is spent in one area, there's less to spend in other areas. Which means if you're a cave salamander, or if you're a salamander who enters a cave, and you have good eyesight, and you're colorful, that took energy to maintain. That means you have less energy that you're spending on your sense of touch, or your sense of smell, or your sense of... Uh, hearing or being able to feel vibrations. Salamanders, the ancestral salamanders that gave rise to these, the ones that had a sense of touch, a strong sense of touch, a strong sense of, of um, smell or the ability to hear or feel, they're the ones who were the most reproductively successful. And if they were spending a lot of energy on their senses of touch, senses of smell, and the ability to feel things, that was less energy that they were spending on their eyes. They would have had offspring, and out of their offspring, the ones that had greater senses of touch and smell, they would have been more reproductively successful. And this would have occurred over many thousands of generations. Having any eyesight at all ultimately was a waste of energy in this environment. And so when we get to the point we're at now, eyes aren't even functional. And if a salamander is born with a mutation or something that causes it to have strong functioning eyes, that means it's devoting energy to something that's useless. It will not be reproductively successful because it has less energy devoted to other senses that are useful in the cave. And we see this same trend with a lot of species in caves. This is a cave fish. No pigment. You don't have to look flashy and there's no need to be protected from any sunlight. And no eyes at all. Again, 
waste of energy, natural selection is not going to favor that. One important point about natural selection, it can only act on genes that already exist. Natural selection chooses which genes proliferate in a population. Natural selection does not create new genes. In other words, if you have a population with the genes A, B, and C, Natural selection will ultimately determine which of these genes experiences greatest proliferation through reproductive success of the individual with them. What natural selection can't do is introduce a new gene into the population. And yet, we see an incredible variety of genes. How did they all get here? Natural selection doesn't produce new genes. Why do we have so many different varieties of genes? How do we get them? The answer to that is mutation. Mutation. Now, when I usually ask students what they think of when they think of mutation, this is what comes to mind, right? X-Men. Mutations don't work like that, unfortunately. Mutations often are not even noticeable. Often they're harmful. Sometimes they're beneficial. But a mutation is the only source of new genes. What is it? It is a copying error. It is a mistake. Literally a copying error of DNA. Populations get new genes introduced through mutation when those mutations occur during the formation of egg or sperm cells. So an organism is let me illustrate this. So mutations can happen to your body cells as well as egg or sperm cells. An example of a mutation that occurs to your body cells would be uh, melanoma skin cancer. So the UV radiation from the sun would cause a mutation that results in the uncontrolled cell growth that is the melanoma. But if a mutation happens during the formation of the egg or the sperm cell, it's called a germ cell mutation. So if you have body cells that ultimately are copying themselves to produce egg or sperm cells, we'll show the sperm cells here. If there is a mutation during the production of the sperm or egg cells, then the new offspring that will be produced are going to be genetically different from what was supposed to be passed on to them because there was an error in the copying process of when that sperm cell or egg cell was made. And that's called a germ cell mutation. And this is how you introduce mutations into the population. So here's an example of a small segment of DNA. So what's supposed to happen when DNA is copied is it's supposed to split and then the two new sides, two new strands come in and pair up with the original parental strand. If you look at the way it works, G and C, which stands for guanine and cytosine, these are the bases within DNA. If you remember, different individuals have different arrangements of letters. That's what makes all of us genetically unique from each other. So when DNA replicates, it's supposed to split. And then since A and T always go together and C and G always go together, you can look at just one half of the strand and figure out the other half. So you better bring in a G, T, T, C. And then over there you can figure it out as well. So this was a successful replication. There were no errors in this. However, let's watch it this time.
This one replicated fine. This one did not. There was supposed to be a C here, and instead we have a G. We said that DNA is like a blueprint for building an organism. Well, in this case, there was an error, a typo, a mistake in the blueprint. A letter was changed. And you might think, it's just one letter. But one letter could make all the difference. And that can completely change the gene and what it's actually coding for. That's how mutations work. When a mutation occurs, that mutation will have one of three possible effects. The first one is the rarest, which is that it increases the fitness of the organism. So if there is a mutation that occurs, that means this individual, well, the, what, the sperm cell will become an individual when it fuses with the egg cell. That individual with that mutation is better fit for the environment than if it didn't have the mutation at all. If that's the case, then that mutation will ultimately proliferate and become much more abundant as natural selection favors it. A more likely scenario is that the mutation decreases the fitness of the organism. If there's a mutation, it's harmful, the individual with it will die before they ever reproduce, which means the mutation doesn't actually enter the gene pool much at all beyond the original individual who had it. The other one, and this is the most common one, is that the mutation is small enough that it has no actual effect on the survival of the organism or the fitness of the organism. Most of you have mutations that you inherited from your parents and you don't even know it because they have such a small effect. And this is the most common thing that we see. As far as this top one goes, increasing fitness, there are a couple of examples in humans that we're going to look at. So if a mutation increases an organism's fitness, over time, that mutation will become more abundant in the population due to natural selection. One mutation that occurred ancestrally in humans is a mutation that causes sickle-shaped red blood cells. This was a result of one letter of DNA accidentally being replaced by a different letter. So ancestrally, this mutation occurred. You would think off the bat that it probably wouldn't be beneficial, but there is a reason why we still see it in abundance throughout much certain parts of the world. So, sickle-shaped blood cells. You have two copies of the gene that codes for the shape of your blood cells. And there are two possible versions of this gene. We're going to represent those with the letter B. Capital B is going to represent the gene for having normal shaped blood cells. Saucer shaped like that. Lowercase b, we're going to have representing sickle shaped blood cells. Kind of like that. If you have two copies of the gene for your sickle for the shape of your blood cells, that means you can either be Two big B's, one of each, or two little B's. Two big B's means you have entirely normal blood cells. Two little B's means that you have single cell disease. One of each, single cell trait. What do your red blood cells do? Your red blood cells assist in the transport of oxygen throughout the body. If you have completely normal red blood cells, then theoretically your oxygen transport should be just fine. If you have two copies of the sickle cell gene, you're going to have serious complications from your lack 
of your ability, the lack of your red blood cells transporting oxygen efficiently. If you have sickle cell trait, you won't have as efficient oxygen transport as someone with normal blood cell shapes, but it's not lethal. It doesn't hurt your fitness immensely as sickle cell disease does. But still, if this one is better, generally, then why is this still so prevalent throughout much of the world, parts of the world? Because this one, sickle cell trait, offers protection in one particular set of circumstances. There is a disease spread by a protist called plasmodium that uses your red blood cells as part of that disease uh, progress. And that is malaria. Malaria kills a lot of people, and it kills a lot of people with normal blood cells. If you have sickle cell trait, mortality from malaria is greatly reduced. Which means, in places where there's a lot of troubles with malaria, having some of the sickle-shaped blood cells, having sickle cell trait, gives you higher fitness. And so if you look at maps of the world, you can see where this particular genetic trait exists and it follows quite closely where malaria outbreaks are still occurring. So when malaria is prevalent, sickle cell trait is still favored because it confers higher fitness. This is a mutation in humans that allows for higher fitness. Another one that occurred in the past was the ability to digest milk sugar. So in dairy products, there is a sugar called lactose. And if you look at lactose, it's actually a two-part sugar, right? So there's two parts to it, it's called glucose and galactose, and they're bonded together. Everybody, when they're a, uh, an infant, produces an enzyme called lactase. Lactase allows our digestive system to break apart the bond here in lactose and easily digest milk and other dairy products. Now, the ancestral condition, the normal, so to speak, condition, was that after infancy, lactase production ceased to the point where we don't have sufficient amounts of it to digest lactose. And so if you drink milk after you're no longer a baby, the ancestral condition was bacteria in your gut attempted to break down lactose instead and it was often extremely, extremely painful. And if anybody is lactose intolerant, you can probably attest to the fact that, yeah, it is quite an unpleasant experience. So what happened? Well, ancestrally, somewhere along the way in, in the distant past, there was a mutation that made it so lactase, the enzyme, didn't go away and the production of lactase didn't shut off after infancy. It kept being made for the entirety of life. So, if you have the ability to digest lactose as an adult, somewhere in the distant past, one of your ancestors had this mutation. Because no other mammal can digest milk after, well, no other mammal does digest milk after infancy. It is not the typical condition. And yet a lot of people nowadays can do this. Because think about it, that opens up a whole new food source. And ancestrally with the way that conditions would have been in terms of food scarcity and difficulty of survival, being able to access dairy products being able to consume milk, that's a great, great trait to have. That allows you to be more fit than people who can't consume milk. 
And that's why lactose tolerance is so widespread nowadays. Here's one other example of a mutation and how natural selection favors certain mutations. And then we'll get to artificial selection after this. So we have two plates of two petri dishes here uh, with antibiotic discs. The one on the left has antibiotic discs that are functioning as they're supposed to. They're preventing this whitish bacterial growth within a certain radius around the disc. So you can see how there's no growth around these discs. Over here, these two discs no longer have any antibiotic property, at least not in regard to this particular bacterial species. It's greatly reduced in this one, as well as this one. This one still has an area of no bacterial growth, so does this one, and so does this one. But as you can see, the bacteria is now resistant to these particular antibiotic discs. So how it works is, Antibiotics target certain aspects of bacteria to ultimately prevent their growth and spread and kill the population that is growing within you. But bacteria reproduce very quickly. Some generation times for bacteria are as uh, small as 20 minutes. And so, what happens is, you get a mutant bacterium. Bacterium is the singular, so you get a mutant bacterium. How does that happen? Well, it's just an error in the copying process. And occasionally, the mutation that happens allows for the bacterium to survive an antibiotics attack. So the antibiotic kills all of the other bacterial cells, but if you remember, bacteria reproduce asexually, which means they effectively clone themselves. And if generation times are 20 minutes or somewhere along that line, it's not going to be very long until that antibiotic resistant bacteria has given rise to millions of bacteria that share its resistance. So this is one example of a mutation that we've clearly seen natural selection favor in certain circumstances. One example of a strain of bacteria that is uh, resistant to certain antibiotics is um, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus. So it's resistant to um, methicillin antibiotic. All right, artificial selection. So natural selection means that organisms that are most fit for their natural environment are the ones that experience the greatest reproductive success. Artificial selection involves humans taking the place of nature. We breed for specific traits. We breed, both animals and plants, for specific traits. So instead of nature selecting the traits, humans do. And most all of what we eat most all of our livestock and pets that we have nowadays have been artificially selected for a very long time. What we have here is we have a wolf and our domestic version, domestic sounds strange when you use it with plants, our artificially selected version of the banana. Let's start with the wolf. I'm sure you're all familiar with our modern day uh, version of the wolf, domestic dog. That is a pug. That is a black pug. So a pug's ancestor, the wolf, shaped through natural forces. There is no natural environment on the planet that would ever favor a pug. We got them because we took 
wolves that had certain, perhaps, mutations, and did a lot of inbreeding, usually with dogs. There was breeding of the offspring back to the mother to proliferate whatever trait we wanted. And so over time, smaller wolves would have been selected through artificial selection. Mutations with, uh, or wolves that had mutations that gave them a much flatter face would have been selected. The larger eyes, you can see, the floppy ears, there were a lot of physical features that had to change in order for us to go from a wolf to a pug. But over thousands of years, with us picking the specific features we wanted and doing a lot of inbreeding, which is why there are a lot of health problems with many dog breeds, we ultimately got what we wanted with our little pug there. Same story with other dog breeds as well. There was usually an unusual one in a litter that had a certain feature that was desired, and so then they would breed that one back to its mother or father, and that's how you get the exaggeration of certain traits in a lot of dogs. That's also why mutts are healthier, though, because you have, you don't, the inbreeding has been harmful for a lot of species health. This is our domestic banana. The variety of banana that we have now is called the Cavendish banana. And at this point, they actually are incapable of sexual reproduction. They don't even have seeds. So all modern banana trees are planted by hocking off a piece of an, another tree, and then it vegetatively asexually reproduces. So this is what we consume now. This is the wild banana. This is the ancestor of our bananas. Notice how much bulky, well, notice that there are seeds. Notice how bulky they are. Notice how much less fruit there is, and notice how much smaller it is. Clearly, if we're going to consume a fruit, we want as much fruit as possible. We want it to taste as sweet as possible, as good as possible. We want to minimize the bulky seeds that are there. And so natural selection over time, natural selection, artificial selection over time, has resulted ultimately in our current variety of banana. Not it, you can see the resemblance with the ancestor in the wild. It lives in s uh, Southeast Asia in the wild. You can see the resemblance with our current bananas, but very different in many ways because of what we have uh, chosen to breed uh, in terms of traits for the banana. Here's just another example of artificial selection. Wild mustard, it's... Uh, pretty innocuous, weedy plant species. But many of our vegetables come from the same species. We've just bred for the exaggeration of certain parts of this plant. So if you look, broccoli and cauliflower actually come from the same ancestral species. It was just that certain features were bred, or we bred for certain features to be exaggerated in each of these particular vegetables. Cauliflower, we bred for sterile flowers. In broccoli, we bred for the suppression of flower development. Kale, we bred for the enlargement of the leaves in wild mustard. In kohlrabi, which I've actually never eaten, we bred for the enhancement of lateral meristems. You can see, all, these, these are terms of uh, meristem and internome. These are plant uh, biological terms that you don't have to know. But just be aware of how natural select Artificial selection has been used to, uh, to basically exaggerate certain features for our benefit. Last but not least, I want to give you one recent example of artificial selection and how it's been used. This is a munchkin cat. This is one of the newest breeds of cats. As you can tell, the legs are not quite the length that they're supposed to be. In 1983, in Louisiana, a woman had a, uh, had a kitten that she found that had stunted legs. She named the kitten Blackberry. That kitten had a litter, ultimately, and uh, that litter gave rise to at least one other cat that had stunted short legs. And from those two cats, we now have an entire breed called the Munchkin breed, a mutation that led to short legs, 
It was decided that it was a beneficial thing to have. We wanted a breed of cat that had these short legs. And so those two individuals were bred and bred and bred and all current munchkin cats come from those, that original cat Blackberry and then some of her kittens from that first litter. And that's often how we get these unusual varieties of domesticated species. All of, most all of our other crops and livestock um, also have been modified through artificial selection. Um, and you can, you can see that if you take a close look at any of those species. That is the end of the evolution lecture.